Well, as you heard the ambassador mention that we have some new members. It's now the TPP 11 and perhaps 12. And as he mentioned, and there are a number of questions about China joining perhaps at some point. And so we're really going to look at all those new, new nations and new partners and new potential partners uh, dimension of the discussion. I just wanted to make two other announcements. I should have mentioned that we are live tweeting during the uh, conference here, and you can follow us on the hashtag TPPWilson. I make that announcement assuring my team that I'm slowly moving into the 21st century. <laughs> and I wanted just also to thank uh, Liz White. Liz, sort of wave, uh, if you would, to everybody who's done a wonderful job, really, in helping organize uh, today's event. Well, it's now my pleasure to welcome back uh, some former public policy scholars at the Wilson Center and a very distinguished uh, uh, old friends here to my left. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Canada and Mexico are just about to become formal negotiators. They were invited to join in June and were quick to accept, and they're now just going through the notification process here and in other countries, and I think it's a 90-day period, so very soon we expect you'll be actively at the table. And we have, uh, as I mentioned, distinguished, uh, pulled together a very distinguished set of experts here. Uh, to my far right and your far left, uh, we have uh, Luz Maria de la Mora Sanchez, former public policy scholar here. She's the founder of LMM. You can see where that came from, <laughs> consulting, and she provides advice to key businesses and leaders on trade uh, negotiating strategy and business opportunities. She, uh, like Woodrow Wilson, before jumping into this world, she was a very active participant in the Mexican government, Under Secretary of International Affairs, as I, International Economic Affairs. Uh, she also was active uh, uh, overseas in representing, uh, in representing Mexico. Uh, she uh, also is a guest lecturer, I believe, at uh, CDE in Mexico City. And as I mentioned, has been a distinguished public policy scholar here. And to my immediate right, and you're more or less left, we have Laura Dawson, who is a, uh, a real authority on U.S.-Canada economic relations. She's also served in the uh, Canadian government. Uh, she served in the Embassy of the United States, rather, as an advisor on U.S.-Canada economic relations. She uh, also has an academic side uh, to her, her Ph.D. from uh, Carleton University, and she, uh, as I mentioned, was a public policy scholar here at the Wilson Center not too long ago. Not too long ago. To, uh, to my left, an old friend, good to have him back in town, Ed Lincoln. Uh, Ed is uh, currently an adjunct professor, is that right, at, uh, or associate professor? Associate professor. Uh, professorial lecturer. Oh, <laughs> well. <laughs> An even more distinguished uh, position, the professorial lecturer at, uh, at uh, George, uh, Georgetown, George Washington oh. University. Uh, he's been a fellow uh, Council of Foreign Relations, fellow at the Brookings Institution. Until recently, he was uh, running a center at the Stern School at NYU in New York with a focus on U.S.-Japan uh, economic relations. He really is an authority on East Asia and Japan. He, uh, again, with a distinguished uh, academic background, Amherst, Ph.D. in economics from Yale, and some public policy experience as a senior advisor to former ambassador to Japan, Walter Mondale. And to, uh, to his left, and to my further left, another old friend, Jeff Schott, who's a longtime senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. He uh, focuses on international trade policy. He has written a host of books, as has Ed. Uh, Jeff's work is really often focused on free trade agreements, international trade, done some work on sanctions. He has been a, a guest lecturer at a number of institutions, including Princeton. Uh, and I was interesting, I did not realize you'd gone to Washington University until I read that. You know. And uh, then has a master's degree from Johns Hopkins uh, SICE here in town. Uh, as he also uh, combines his academic life with a background before that at the, I think, the U.S. Treasury, where he was actively involved in international trade negotiations and, and continues to serve on senior advisory committees. Well, two of our distinguished panel, and we're going to start with the new members, that the members that made it the TPP-11. We're going to start with Canada. 
And uh, maybe we can pull our chairs back because you're both going to do a PowerPoint presentation. Good afternoon. And thank you so much to the Program on America and the Global Economy and the Canada Institute for the uh, invitation. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, as you heard from the introduction, I'm from Canada. And some of you, many of you might have visited Canada. You know that despite our geographic landmass, we're a small country. Population-wise, economy-wise, we're about the same size as, uh, as the state of California. But we aspire to greatness. <laughs> so you can imagine my delight last night when I turned on the Olympics and I was watching the U.S. Uh, uh, Olympic women's basketball team. And what I heard was that the Yukon, Yukon girls were tearing up the court. I thought, Yukon? Isn't that delightful? Women from the Canadian North are on the, Ameri <laughs> <laughs> on the American team. Well, many of you know my mistake. Yukon, <laughs> not Canadian territory, but University of Connecticut. <laughs> Go Yukon. Uh, our admission to the Trans-Pacific Partnership was a lot like junior high school. When the Trans-Pacific Partnership liked <laughs> us back in 2005, we didn't like it very much. You guys weren't involved. It was, uh, it was that, that Brunei trade agreement. I'm like, really, Brunei? So we let that one go past to our great uh, uh, sadness later on. We liked it better once we realized that the Doha was dead and much better after the United States went in. But then, like junior high school, we went running after your attention, and your attention had moved on to other more attractive dance partners, I guess. <laughs> so we didn't expect that the U.S. would wave the flag on behalf of Canada until we met some conditions. And, and I think we met those conditions. We provided a, a minimally acceptab acceptable copyright bill. Uh, and I think, maybe we did, maybe we didn't, put our dairy supply management on the negotiating table. <laughs> that, that remains to be seen. Uh, but now that we're in, or I should say just barely in, because we have to wait another uh, 60 days or so before we actually get into the negotiations. So we won't be at the next round. We'll be waiting in the parking lot, gunning the engines. So the reason why Canada finds the Trans-Pacific Partnership such a compelling trade agreement is this pretty much the same reasons why the U.S. does. It gives us a foothold in uh, Asia-Pacific markets. We don't currently have any Asia-Pacific agreements. And it also helps us negotiate a next-generation trade agreement in areas that, fi uh, that businesses find, find important, what uh, Ambassador Maranta says, the neat and interesting stuff. So, so we're excited about that neat and interesting stuff as well. But here's some of the practicalities of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Some of you have seen this slide before. I stole it from the internet. Every circle represents a separate trade agreement. That means that every one of these circles requires different administrative mechanisms for moving goods across borders. Each time you have to deal with these administrative mechanisms, that costs money. Some estimate that it adds about 5% to the cost of a finished good. So by consolidating some of these little noodles into a bigger TPP noodle, we expect that this is going to reduce the costs for, uh, uh, for uh, business people. So that's one reason. Another reason, of course, is, the future, uh, is future growth. Now, if you look at this, this is U.S. exports to TPP members. And right now, it's clear that Canada and Mexico are your biggest markets. And all of the other TPP, kind of, sort of, right now, it's not very impressive, is it? If you had to make a decision based on this slide, you'd be like, eh, I don't know. But what we're really looking at is future growth. First of all, we're looking for countries that are big. Um, if you look at the TPP countries, we have a number of strong, uh, large population countries, in particular Vietnam, Mexico. If we're able to get, say, India, Philippines into the agreement, those would be uh, uh, 100 million apiece. If we were to add China, that would be 10 times the population of Mexico. So that's a very substantial emerging market. Um, and, and that's really important because Canada and the United States right now 75% of our trade is with shrinking economies. The so-called mature economies that everybody wanted to do a Doha round deal with are now yesterday's news. We want to get in with that 
25% that are growing. And not only are the populations growing, and, oh, I should mention that those emerging market economies, the median age is under 30. We in the mature economies also have mature populations. We're heading to the rest homes. <laughs> so look now at the growth rates of TPP members. U.S. growth rate is somewhere less than 2% than annually. Uh, uh, Peru's growth rate is approaching 7%. Those are the folks that we want to be doing trade agreements with. So we want to be positioned there for the future. Where do Canada's interests lie for the negotiations? Well, our interests are pretty much what your interests are. We, Canada, Mexico, and the US are pretty much integrated because of the NAFTA. Unfortunately, we've used up the benefits of the NAFTA and have to negotiate the next generation of issues. And so you, the TPP for us is a beachhead for North American competitiveness. And so we're going to be a really strong ally for you on things like investment, services, uh, product and food standards, intellectual property. Um, it's uh, in our interest to align ourselves with you because that's where our trade regime already is. The only problem is some of the neat and interesting stuff that we heard about might actually go off the rails. Now, I don't know for sure because we're not in those negotiations yet, but I read inside US trade. I read Jamie just like the rest of you do. And it looks like there's a temptation for the US to fragment these negotiations, to play its trading partners against each other. One of the things that I find uh, most concerning is, uh, is market access and the proposal that the US should negotiate separate market access agreements with all of the different partners. Well, what does that do? That makes the other smaller partners suspicious, worried that somebody else is getting a better deal. We feel like we're being picked off, playing one end against the middle. And I don't think this is really good for the US either because it means that we're not giving our best efforts to have a shared uh, pool of benefits from all partners. So that's one example of something I'm worried about. Um, and also, separate administration of trade agreements, uh, tariff and border measures, adds more noodles to the bowl and makes it more, more expensive. The TPP is a proxy for what we couldn't achieve in the WTO. It's an opportunity for us to work together to find new ways of doing things. Um, but another example of ways that fragmentation could throw this agreement off the rails in San Diego last month, Assistant USTR Weisel said that as a condition of their admission, Mexico and Canada had to accept that the parts of the agreement that were already negotiated wouldn't be reopened. Okay, fine, that will slow down the process. We're okay with that. But then she also said that if, if Japan were to come into the negotiations, that they would consider reopening the negotiations because, or reopening the negotiating text, because they will have to go back to Congress for each new member. Well, how is that fair? If that's the case, then we're going to be going from WTO to WTF, <laughs> as my daughter would say. <laughs> and I don't think that's any way to treat your closest trading partners and your neighbors. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Well, Luce is getting ready to make her presentation. So you can see that Laura was clearly using her noodle when she <laughs> put together <laughs> those slides. And uh, people my age, of course, grew up knowing that you couldn't trust anyone over 30. Now apparently you can't export anyone over 30. So <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I first of all want to thank the Woodrow Wilson Center for um, their kind invitation to participate in this event today. It's really a privilege. I feel very uh, happy to be able to be back here after being a, a policy scholar a few years ago. And uh, well, before I start, I would like to say that uh, I'm talking from a perspective of somebody who's an interested observer, as all of, all of you here are, in terms of the TPP and in terms of trade. 
And I'm talking also um, based on my own personal professional experience having participated in Mexico Strait negotiation for around 15 years. And um, as many of you may um, think, the question is why Mexico right now, six, se seven months ago, decided to participate in TPP? No? Why, why Mexico is a late comer to this negotiation that, uh, as Laura was saying, it seems pretty obvious that we need to be part of it. And in this presentation, I'm going to try to explain a little bit or to share with you um, my um, analysis on what I think Mexico's opportunities, challenges, and uh, work will have to, to be for a hopefully successful participation in TPP. Well, um, let, me try, let me start by saying that, um, as uh, Laura already said, and in the same fashion as, as Canada, Mexico also initially refused to participate in TPP when uh, the four P4 countries offered to, um, offered, um, to, to be part of the party. No? Um, and why, why was this the case? Well, um, in my opinion, um, this responded to um, domestic political environment that um, covered Mexico trade policy, has covered Mexico trade policy for the last 12 years. And I have to say that the two pan administrations, the Calderon administration and the Fox administration. Um, why, why, why did this happen? The pan governments that came into power in, in 2000 found it very difficult to define a new trade agenda, a new trade strategy. And the private sector, who suffered a lot from um, China's accession to WTO, not only in the US market, but also in Mexico, um, really tried to build a shield to imports and to trade. So Mexico's private sector basically built a protectionist agenda that did not want to know anything else about trade negotiations. In fact, in 2003, Secretary Canales, at that time Secretary of Economy, he said Mexico will not negotiate any more new free trade agreements. And that took everybody by surprise, included some government officers at that time. So basically, uh, Mexico was um, getting mixed signals on trade from its private sector, but also from its um, government officers. And as I will explain a little bit later, um, Mexico only requested to become part in, the, in, in TPP in the APEC Honolulu Summit in November 2011 after um, in 2010, after having said that we were not interested in participating in the TPP negotiation because basically the private sector in Mexico was not interested in getting involved. So Mexico becomes a latecomer to TPP um, Mexico is admitted to um, participate in TPP in the Los Cabos Summit in, in the G20, seven months after it requests um, admission. And on July 9, the White House formally notified the U.S. Congress its intentions to exclude Mexico in the negotiation, which implies a 90-day period consultation period before Mexico can join negotiations. What does this really mean? Me this means for Mexico that Mexico will not be able to participate in the TPP negotiation until uh, 14 rounds of negotiations have been completed. And this is something completely unprecedented in Mexico's trade negotiation. This is, why is Mexico doing this? Well, Mexico thinks right now that it needs to participate in TPP for reasons that I will explain later. However, as uh, Laura was already saying, one of the main concerns right now for, for Mexico and for the private sector and for all who are following the, the process is what will be those requirements <coughs> that will result after the 90 period consultation? Will, will there be new requirements? Will there, what is it that we have to expect from this, from this negotiation process? We don't know. And we will only know probably by early October and after the 14th round of negotiations have been completed. And as Laura was already saying, the same that applied to Canada will apply to Mexico, meaning that Mexico accepted to take the texts that have already been completed or the drafts that have already been completed um, 
once um, Mexico takes part of it, because if the nine TPP partners have already agreed to a tax, then Mexico will not be able to sh come up with new ideas, no? with, with uh, innovations. D is this a good idea for Mexico? Is it not a good idea for Mexico? Well, that's something that we don't know. And uh, that's something that we will have to figure out once um, the negotiation is in place and Mexico is able to participate in the actual negotiation. Now, why is it that Mexico is willing to pay this high price? Well, I, I want to say, um, I want to put forward three main reasons, which I think give us a little bit of perspective. First of all, Mexico needs to guarantee its US market share. Mexico is um, the third largest trading partner to the US, but it's our most important export market. We export 80% of um, exports to the US. It's our most important uh, trading partner. So we need to guarantee that uh, any preferences that are granted to other trading partners are also granted to Mexico or that Mexico doesn't lose its competitive edge in the US market. Second, Mexico needs to build stronger bridges with key markets in Asia to make it a two-way street. Today, Mexico's trade with Asia is very unbalanced. It's a one to nine ratio. And um, countries, for example, Malaysia, is becoming a very important uh, import um, um, source for Mexico. And third, but and not least, the definition of new trade rules to strengthen Mexico's export platform. In Mexico, trade, um, trade accounts for 60% of GDP. So really, Mexico needs to be at the discussion of new trade rules because Mexico is very dependent on international trade and exports for its own growth. Now, which are the challenges that Mexico faces? Well, Mexico in the last 12 years has been, um, has had very difficult, has had it very difficult with the private sector to be able to define a trade agenda with the Asia Pacific. Mexico is part of APEC um, since 1991 and Mexico has a free trade agreement with Japan. And that's all our institutional um, framework with the Asia Pacific. Mexico has refused to negotiate uh, in the past bilateral free trade agreements with Australia and New Zealand, basically because they're agricultural powerhouses and Mexico feels that um, the agricultural sector is gonna be very affected. So Mexico decided to re reject those um, offerings. And um, in the case of Malaysia or Vietnam, Mexico has also been very defensive in terms of uh, traditional manufacturing like textiles uh, and apparel or footwear. However, Mexico um, has established um, a tariff elimination scheme that will um, establish its MFN import tariff, its uh, MFN average import tariff at 4.2% basically for manufacturing. But Mexico maintains some tariff picks. In 2012, for example, the tariff picks are basically in agriculture and in sectors like textiles, apparel, footwear, and automobiles. Now, where, where is the, the gain in terms of trade? As um, in the case of Canada, um, Mexico's trade with, the si with these six trading partners in the TPP represents only 1.3% of total trade. And uh, as it's shown in this table, Mexico's exports to these six countries only account for 0.5% of its total exports to the world. Mexico's exports last year uh, were mo almost 300 billion. And to these six countries, uh, trade ex exports, Mexican exports only accounted uh, to um, $1.7 billion. So in terms of exports, I'm not, I, I don't want to say that there's no gain there, but the gain is really minor in terms of um, the export opportunities for Mexico. Mexico also faces very serious challenges in terms of rules of origin, rules of origin that can actually contribute to strengthening Mexico's production capacity and also strengthening Mexico's integration in the North American market. Uh, the rule of origin was one of the reasons why Mexico rejected negotiating a, a Mexico uh, Sing Singapore FTA and uh, negotiations with Singapore were derailed after seven rounds of negotiations because the private sector in Mexico was very concerned about transshipment issues. Disciplines on state-owned enterprises may require constitutional changes, for example, in the energy sector where private uh, participation, domestic or foreign, is prohibited. And if um, this is going to be at the table of negotiation, it will be something that the, future, the, the next administration in Mexico will have to deal with. Public procurement has been a, an area of, of 
free trade agreements where the Mexican private sector has been completely incapable of taking advantage of. The, the Mexican private sector has not seen any benefit of uh, negotiating public procurement. And the question here is what else in terms of um, opening in this sector? In terms of IP, the rule of law, um, as everybody knows, uh, ACTA is one of the most sensitive issues in Mexico, politically speaking, because the president decided to sign uh, ACTA as a um, good faith or a, a building confidence measure for participation in TPP, while the Senate in Mexico has been completely adamant about um, making this um, domestic law. We don't know exactly how much um, ACTA uh, really is going to tie the hands of the Mexican government, but it w what we do know it is that it has become a very, very politically sensitive issue between the executive and Congress. And in terms of regulatory coherence, we also don't know exactly what this will mean for Mexico in the past. Uh, when Mexico decided to adopt the same standards and recognize the, the technical standards for electronics in, in Mexico uh, from the US, uh, the private sector took the executive to the Supreme Court because they were completely opposed to that. So what are the opportunities for Mexico? Well, Mexico already has free trade agreements with the US, with Chile, and with Peru. And also, in case Japan comes in, with Japan and Canada, of course. And Mexico's trade with these five countries already represents almost 75% of our total trade. Uh, the TPP will hopefully help diversify Mexico's ex export markets in, for example, electronics, um, electric products, and agriculture, to name a few. And also will help diversify import sources uh, from these countries where Mexico already is uh, in, in importing a lot. And uh, basically, Mexico's um, new export opportunities will be in the manufacturing sector, automobiles and auto parts, steel, electronics, and cosmetics. Not only um, for Mexico to become an export platform to TPP countries, but also to try to build some integration with uh, NAFTA in terms of the US and Canada to, to export to, to, to TPP countries. Now, in terms of investment, TPP membership will also allow Mexico to remain an attractive location for FDI. Uh, Mexico today is the sixth FDI recipient among emerging markets, and it is very important for Mexico to have these kind of institutional frameworks to offer um, to, to new investors in Mexico. Also, the TPP could be a good push for domestic reforms in Mexico. It would be a good opportunity for Mexico to push its second round of reforms that will allow Mexico to grow at higher rates. For example, uh, in the energy sector, where there's basically a state monopoly, what we have today, and that we know that mm, something needs to be done in order to boost Mexico's economic growth in telecommunications, transportation, banking, and even a fiscal law, uh, fiscal reform that's been pending for the last almost 40 years in Mexico. Institutional strengthening uh, may also be something positive for Mexico in terms of improving its trade policy framework, given that Mexico's dependence on exports is um, key to, export, uh, to, to economic growth, and also given that Mexico is the 10th largest exporter in the world. And also building trading blocks with NAFTA, with Asia, and with Latin America. Why Mexico needs to be part of TPP negotiation it's, it's not really the question, it's how much it will cost Mexico. I think that it's very clear that um, TPP is one of the few in initiatives where things are taking place and where, where things are happening. TPP opens the possibilities for Mexico to maintain its competitive in the US market, in the NAFTA, and also to maintain its market share in the US market. Mexico needs to avoid um, being um, displaced by not only t current TPP competitors, but also future TPP competitors. Mexico um, has to consider TPP as a way to increase its exports to Asia and consider Mexico as an export platform to Asia, where right now we have, been, uh, we, we have very low grades. And we really need to build new trade institutions to increase our relationship with the Asian markets where today it remains basically a one-way one street. Thank you very much. Listening to, to Luce, we might want to update Porfirio Diaz by saying, lucky Mexico, maybe far from God, but so close to its to major export <laughs> markets. <laughs> Why don't exactly. we move our chairs up? <laughs>
And then I'd like to hear from Japan, and then we'll, we're going to have China bat cleanup this week. Okay. The major, major economy there. All right. So we move on from the two countries that are coming into TPP, two countries that might come into TPP. Um, my message on Japan is don't hold your breath. <laughs> now, let me start with a bit of history, partly because I see a lot of faces in this audience who appear to be too young to know much of the history of trade policy and Japan. I've lived through it anyway. What's that? <laughs> who have lived through it. They, <laughs> may, they may be smart enough to, to know about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, sorry. <laughs> in the earlier post-World War II period, Japan was quite closed uh, to almost everything except raw materials. You know, raw materials, if they didn't have them, they needed them, yeah, that was easy to get in. Everything else faced high tariffs, strict quotas, uh, foreign direct investment into Japan was also strictly uh, controlled in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, the United States, or the U.S. government, eventually got uh, tired of this. We tolerated it in the, in the 1950s as a poor, devastated country was uh, recovering from the war. But starting in the 1960s, we went through roughly 30 years of protracted, difficult trade negotiations. Some of that, unfortunately, was all about restricting Japanese access to the U.S. market, which as an economist I didn't think was a good idea. But a lot of it was about trying to bludgeon open Japan, saying, look, you're a big affluent country now. You need to open up your markets. I can tell you with some confidence that you know, the Japan of today is a lot more open than it was even 15, 20 years ago. Uh, if you walk into Japanese supermarkets now, you will find vegetables from around Asia, including a lot uh, from China. You will see reasonably priced imported wine, uh, things like that. But arguably, Japan is still considerably less open to imports and inward investment than it ought to be given its status as a large, affluent, very advanced uh, industrial, uh, post-industrial, if you wish, uh, economy. Uh, we still see, for example, fairly sizable pockets of, uh, of restrictions in agriculture, particularly in rice, uh, but also in the form of high tariffs on citrus fruits and things like that. Uh, in pharmaceuticals and medical devices, yes, American companies do quite well in the Japanese market, but if you talk to them for more than three minutes, they'll start ticking off a whole host of, of uh, restrictions that continue to, to hinder their ability to operate in Japan. Uh, financial services, again, much more open than it was in the 1980s, uh, but also with a series of uh, regulations and restrictions that tend to, uh, to hurt foreign firms, uh, the most visible of which at the moment is the continuation of Japan Post Bank and Japan Post Insurance Company owned by the government uh, with a variety of unfair advantages as a state-owned uh, enterprise. Um, other kinds of services, legal services um, and whatnot, also uh, continue to have various restrictions. Therefore, uh, Japan, for Japan to join TPP would require some fairly substantial concessions on their part uh, in order to be, uh, to, to be able to come through those negotiations successfully. If you think in terms of the easier things to negotiate have already been done, then maybe what remains is more difficult for them. Second point I'd like to make is that uh, <clears throat> certainly in, in principle, Japan has embraced the notion of bilateral and regional free trade agreements uh, starting around the year uh, 2000. <clears throat> it has now more than a dozen uh, of these agreements. However, uh, the consensus among economists and other analysts who've looked at these is that these are not very high quality uh, FTAs. Um, the Japanese government, for example, is actually very proud of saying, oh, 
we have what they call new age uh, agreements because they include services. I've actually read all the way through the agreement with Singapore and on services it tends, the agreements tend to be in the area of legal services. We will establish a bilateral committee that will report back in four years on what, if anything, can be done to uh, expand access. That's not a very strong agreement. Uh, therefore, you could argue that Japan might not be quite ready for TPP because uh, people like Ambassador Morantis have been emphasizing that this will be a, a, uh, the standard setting high quality trade agreement. I think that scares the Japanese um, because theirs have, have not been. In a more positive tone, in the past decade or last 15 years or so, there has been a rising voice in Japan of both academic economists, some politicians, some other commentators on public affairs in favor of making Japan more open. In fact, even that Singapore agreement, which was not such a great agreement, there were people in both the, fine, uh, the, the foreign ministry and the Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry who said, oh yes, we really need this because the problem in Japan is that we have become inefficient uh, and we need to reallocate resources away from inefficient industries toward efficient ones and we need to become more open internationally to help drive that process. As an economist, this really made me happy. Right? Economists have been preaching this ever since the time of Adam Smith uh, that yes indeed, uh, being open to trade pushes your economy out of those industries in which you are relatively less efficient and expands your opportunities in those in which you are relatively more efficient. So it was nice to hear this coming from some Japanese. Uh, those are the kinds of, of people in Japan who've actually been in favor of Japan joining the TPP negotiations. All of that said, I really think it is unlikely that Japan is going to join the TPP negotiations in the near future for several reasons. One, opposition remains quite strong. I was actually rather startled uh, in the, let's see, I guess in the spring of 2011, uh, then Prime Minister Khan made some comments about how Japan ought to join TPP. His successor in September of that year Prime Minister Noda uh, was even more enthusiastic, uh, mentioned to President Obama that yes, we would, we're, we're thinking about this, we were, haven't made a decision yet, but we're thinking about this, led to a real outburst of visible opposition uh, in Japan. I happened to be in Japan in October last year uh, and walked into my favorite bookstore and, and on the floor of the bookstore where they sell economics and business books, they have a, a table where they always have a collection of the books on the latest really hot topic in Japan. When I was there, the topic happened to be TPP. This was only about a month after Prime Minister Noda had said that Japan really ought to join TPP. There were 16 books on TPP. <laughs> 14 of those books were negative with titles like uh, TPP will destroy Japan. Uh, Japan, the, um, uh, the running dog of American capitalism. And, uh, not, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not much. But, you know, provocative, negative titles. Uh, meanwhile, you know, well-known pundits, um, uh, Kent, you may remember Mr. Sakakibara. Oh, yes. Uh, he started writing op-ed pieces in opposition to, uh, to TPP. So, there is still strong opposition in general. Uh, second, Prime Minister Noda faces this opposition within his own political party, the Democratic Party of Japan. He himself is a part of a, of a faction within that party, says, yep, we gotta do this uh, for all those reasons that the pro-TPP people were saying. But a lot of his party is opposed to it. Uh, his party in general is slipping in popularity. 
All right, this party is the first non-liberal democratic party government of Japan uh, since the 1950s, elected in, in 2009. Uh, and, and, and they were elected because people had gotten tired for a whole variety of reasons uh, of the Liberal Democratic Party. Uh, and now his own party is slipping rather dramatically, in part because people perceive that the policies of this party are drifting more and more back in the direction of what the Liberal Democratic Party uh, was doing when they were uh, in power. So you say, wait a minute, they, these guys were supposed to be the reformers, how come they don't sound so reformist anymore? So he's got opposition within his party. He's got this problem that the party as a whole is slipping in popularity. Uh, that will hinder the process of tackling this controversial issue. He has actually tackled three controversial issues. This is, surprises me somewhat. You know, Japanese prime ministers typically only get one big controversial issue that they can handle. Uh, and once they've successfully dealt with it, either they fall on their own sword or someone sticks a sword through them and out they go. <laughs> right? He's taken on three. Raising the nationwide consumption tax uh, from 5% to 10%. Uh, restarting nuclear reactors in Japan. And TPP. I gave those to you in the order of priority. The highest priority for this government is getting this tax increase through. He will probably do it. Uh, just a few hours ago, he worked out an agreement with the Liberal Democratic Party that they, not his own party, but, but the Liberal Democratic Party at least, will support the tax increase so long as the Prime Minister promises that there will be an election for the lower house of the parliament soon. I have no idea what soon means. Uh, but uh, apparently this is the deal that he has just worked out. So he will do that. That means relatively soon there will be an election. His party is going to get thrown out of office. Uh, and that, if nothing else, is going to delay any decision on TPP. Uh, his second order of priority is restarting nuclear power. This is certainly one where um, there is huge public opposition in Japan. Uh, he and his party have been kind of captured by this dilemma that on the one hand, yeah, maybe it's a good idea to move away from nuclear energy, but since just before the earthquake, Japan had been getting 30% of its electric power from nuclear energy, having all of the nuclear power plants in Japan shut down puts a big hole in nuclear, in, in electrical uh, power supply. So he's doing something very unpopular, having started up uh, two of the nuclear reactors. That leaves TPP. As far as I'm concerned, TPP is nowhere. The people who were opposed to the tax increase, opposed to restarting nuclear reactors, also happen to be opposed to TPP. He may be willing to fight them on the tax issue, may be willing to fight them on the nuclear power issue, but TPP, I think, is going to fall uh, by uh, the wayside. Um, so uh, personally, I think this is unfortunate. Um, as Canada and Mexico have decided joining TPP is good for themselves. Uh, I happen to belong to the camp as an, as an economist that says joining TPP would be good for Japan. Uh, it needs more structural reform uh, in the economy uh, to do well in the, in the future, and this would help that process. But... Uh, for the reasons that I've just gone through, I don't think this is going to happen uh, right now. Will it happen later on? Could. Uh, you know, five years from now, the political situation in Japan might possibly have uh, moved to some new equilibrium in which those in favor of TPP are winning out, and Japan comes in after the agreement is negotiated. Uh, but I do think it is unlikely that they will join in time for uh, the current rounds of uh, negotiation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Shaw. Thank you, Kent. Uh, 
I appreciate the invitation from the Wilson Center to uh, invite me to participate in this very distinguished panel. And I also want to thank Ambassador Marantis for answering all the questions on China. <laughs> so uh, he actually uh, did a good job on that, didn't he? And uh, that's uh, all that uh, needs to be said. Actually not. Let me give you a little bit of context uh, so that you have a deeper ap appreciation of what he said and what it possibly means uh, for the TPP process. Now, among all the, the countries who uh, we've discussed today, China is the only one who isn't participating, isn't interested in participating right now. It's not participating, but it is at the table. It is in the minds of every negotiator at the negotiating table uh, that are crafting the pact or those that are seeking to join the TPP. Uh, it's hard to conceive of a comprehensive Asia-Pacific trade agreement uh, that does not eventually include China. Uh, but right now, every one of the TPP countries is competing furiously with Ch China, is trading, is investing with China. China is a, a critical partner for them. And so how the TPP affects their competitiveness uh, really will affect their ability and their trading and investment relationship with China. China is on the minds of everyone at the table in the TPP negotiations. Now, the TPP participants already have extensive trade and investment ties with China uh, and uh, expect those flows to increase markedly in the future. They also expect China to become involved in new trade talks with TPP countries as they proceed f forward towards that long-term APEC goal of free trade and investment in the Asia-Pacific region. China, in turn, has a vested interest in maintaining good access to TPP markets that when uh, countries that could well join the talks in the coming, let's say, 12 to uh, 18 months, which is a period, by the way, when the negotiations will still be underway. Don't, don't be, uh, you know, <laughs> don't, don't be uh, 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 disabused of the fact that the talks have made a lot of progress, but they're no, nowhere close to being concluded. Mm -hmm and probably won't be until the end of 2013 at the earliest, maybe 2014. In any event, if you add those countries, which includes Canada and Mexico, and probably also includes Japan, and I'll rebut or, or give you a different view from, from Ed in, in, in a minute on that, but also includes Korea. Uh, I think if, if you take those, those 13 countries, that ac they account for about 40% of Chinese merchandise trade. So China is involved in this TPP process one way or another. Uh, and that's why I, I think it's important that, and I, uh, that, uh, and I think Kent, uh, Kent made the right uh, call in including China in, in this discussion. Now, in the short run, China is likely to pursue and deepen its ties with its Asian neighbors before engaging with the TPP countries. Such restraint is basically due to political priorities as well as a lack of readiness and willingness to pursue a comprehensive trade accord. Now, uh, as Ambassador Moranta said, what the negotiators are working on is something more comprehensive and legally binding than the trade arrangements that have been forged in the past by the United States or by, certainly by the Asian countries whose agreements are generally much more shallow integration arrangements uh, than we have seen uh, uh, concluded by the United States or Korea uh, in, in recent years. Uh, and uh, because of that, some observers have concluded that TPP participants actually intend to exclude China from their integration arrangement, because it's just the bar is set too high uh, in terms of transparency of domestic policies and the rigor of disciplines on government in interventions in the marketplace. Uh, though similar types of arguments could be made about Vietnam, and Vietnam has made a political commitment at least to try uh, to uh, achieve that type of uh, 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 level of obligation and commitment. Whether they'll succeed or not 
is, 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 is something that will be pursued during the negotiations. Uh, others take the argument uh, even further and claim that the United States is trying to keep China out of the TPP, despite what the ambassador said, and is trying to contain China uh, in order to retard its economic and political influence in the region. Well, I was very pleased that Ambassador Marantis did not uh, uh, mention that theme. It is still very prevalent if you travel around Asia. Uh, uh, observers, uh, officials, businessmen pick up very, very closely on, on, on the commentary that has been heard in the Congress and elsewhere about the containment st strategy. And so I think uh, uh, it's, it's worth a few comments about this because uh, those types of, of, of statements uh, can be very damaging uh, to, for United States interests uh, uh, and, uh, and, need, and need to be rebutted. Uh, let, me, let me make a few points about the containment thesis, and it falls flat on several, for several reasons. First, and most obviously, a trade agreement cannot contain a large country, either economically or politically. Uh, I mean, the fact that you would think of that negotiating a trade agreement is part of a great uh, geostrategic containment strategy is, is laughable, and yet some serious people talk about it, and they need to be laughed at. <laughs> uh, second, uh, more seriously, U.S. officials need a cooperative China to confront the myriad problems facing the world economy and the security challenges posed by new and aspiring nuclear nations in Asia. Both countries need to work together and therefore must manage the inevitable frictions that arise as the breadth and scope of their commercial relations expand. We've seen that with the recent sanctions with, with Iran. It's, it's prevalent every day in, our, in, in, in dealing with North Korea. This is a very, very real and, and important consideration. Third, no one else in Asia wants to contain China either. Uh, the trade and investment integration in the Asia-Pacific region achieved over the past few decades benefits all the TPP participants, even as it poses competitiveness challenges for their manufacturing industries. And that's, I think, an important point. We should be using the TPP to strengthen our competitiveness. And if, if it has some impact on China, it's going to mean that we're going to become more competitive in dealing with China at, in our home market and in export markets. Uh, that's, I think, one of the major advantages of TPP, certainly for Canada and Mexico, but for the United States as well. Now, uh, time, is, time is running short, uh, and I know you, you want to get a few uh, 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 questions uh, in, uh, so I'll, I'll skip over a few points. Uh, but to say that one should not discount the possibility that China can will be able to join uh, the, uh, the TPP in the medium term. It already has accepted obligations far greater than most developing countries in its uh, accession to the WTO. So its market is much more open in terms of its border barriers uh, to, uh, to, export, uh, to imports and to investment than most other developing countries. Now, the, r the rub is that it's, in its internal, its domestic policies are the ones that have the real restrictive effects. And those are the policies that the TPP is trying to, uh, 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 trying to discipline. And that's where China runs afoul. And that's why I said before it has problems with both the transparency and the rules on government interventions in the marketplace. Now, it's dealing with that incrementally. It's engaged in a lot of free trade agreements in the region, most of which are not worthy of the name of free trade. But the more recent ones, particularly the agreement with New Zealand, has achieved much, more, much higher levels of obligation in goods and services than has been achieved in the past. And the upcoming negotiations with Korea, actually the talks that uh, have just started uh, in May of this year, promise to, uh, to, to, to push China to a much higher level of obligation, even though much, much less, obviously, than uh, Korea has negotiated with either the United States or the European Union. 
But you can see this incremental progress where China is, is in incrementally grab, uh, 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 committing to higher and higher levels of international trade commitments. It's almost like a, a learning curve. It's, it's starting with the easier uh, task, maybe going through an exhibition series uh, season of, of, of free trade negotiations, getting ready for the major league uh, openers uh, with the major markets where, the, where we'd have a substantial agreement. That'll take some time, and the political objectives of, of China in its own neighborhood will dominate over the next few years. But I don't discount the possibility that China uh, could be uh, trying to partner and work with its other APEC uh, countries in, uh, uh, in the next three to five years. Maybe not signing on to TPP, but negotiating a deal that bridges the Asia integration arrangements with the Asia-Pacific TPP-style integration arrangements. Now, what could drive that bridging process? And this will be my last point, and it will link to Ed's point. Uh, it's likely to be what China, Korea, and Japan do among themselves. Uh, because if my thesis is right, and, and Korea and Japan end up joining the, uh, the uh, TPP sooner rather than later, they will be in both the Asia integration schemes, the 10 plus 3, 10 plus 6, and in the TPP. And China will be moving closer towards a TPP-style norm over the years because of its interactions with Japan and Korea. Now, Ed made a strong case on why politics is likely to uh, lead to a lot of foot dragging and delay in Japan. But I think Japan can't afford to be isolated. And if you look into next year in Japanese politics, which is maybe a couple of prime ministers away, <laughs> uh, Japan more. politicians will realize that they are being isolated, that the rest of the world is moving forward in, in, in trade agreements, in integration arrangements in the neighborhood. And then when uh, that they're uh, aspiring talks with Korea and, and, and uh, China are really not getting anywhere because the level of, of ambition in those talks is of the type of uh, uh, shallow integration uh, that China has done with ASEAN, then they'll see that with Korea in the TPP, that, that will be the, the driver. And uh, so that's my reason for being a little more optimistic than, than, uh, than Ed, that this process may accelerate next year. But I share his, 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 his uh, con concern and, and skepticism about uh, forward progress uh, throughout the rest of this year. So that's my, my appraisal, and I uh, hope that it's useful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> well, well, let's uh, open it up for questions. And again, I invite the overflow rooms to submit questions to us. There's a gentleman in the back and then a gentleman here on the side and another gentleman in the back and then we'll go to the other side of the room. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Jim Berger from Super Washington Trade Daily. Um, Mr. Marantz, Ambassador Marantz uh, didn't answer, ask, answer my question about elections. I just want to ask uh, you. Uh, isn't it a whole new ball game next year if we have a new president or even if we have a second term of the uh, current president? You want me to? That's the, I'm the, the person <laughs> who loves politics all the time. <laughs> I think actually that there's a very good chance that uh, the TPP is in the long run interest of the United States and that tends to drive, I think, uh, long term trade negotiations. So in this particular case, I wouldn't necessarily keep my eye on the near-term elections. Would the panel agree with that? This I'm being Mr. Optimism yeah. here. Well, I, I would just add, though, that apparently um, Mitt Romney is on the record saying he doesn't want Japan to join the negotiations at the present time. So as, as opposed, you know, the administration has said, if Japan can get around to it, we'd be glad to have them. But uh, Romney apparently has chosen to disagree with that. Add that Canada is on the sidelines concerned about the absence of trade promotion authority and, and what's going to happen with that. Uh, and currently, uh, USTR is dotting the I's and crossing the T's as though trade promotion authority existed and following all the proper procedures, but it's not there. Um, so we're hoping that this doesn't create problems in the future. <laughs>
just urge a little patience. <laughs> <laughs> we are the soul of patience. There's a gentleman in the back. Please inter identify yourself. Okay, thank you. Dong Kui Yu with China Review News Agency. My question is for Mr. Jeff. Um, you mentioned that the TPP is not uh, mean to contain China, um, but I think um, most most of the people in, in China believe that this is the U.S. effort to try to uh, play a leading role in Asia Pacific uh, economically and also uh, want to at least offset the Chinese influ influence in the uh, Asia Pacific uh, trade system. So are you concerned that the TPP standard is too high for all the member to get a consensus and 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 then they turn to kinds of uh, bilateral trade, uh, free trade agreement with China? Uh, well, first of all, uh, both the United States and China gain from deeper integration in the region. And that's why they've both been working together for a long time in APEC on the long-term strategy uh, and objective of, of achieving closer integration in the region. So that's, that's not the issue. This uh, the, uh, the objective of the exercise is not to have a trade agreement, is to promote economic growth, increased imports, increased exports, increased employment in all of our economies. Uh, so the trade agreement is not the magic bullet that it will achieve all of that, but it, 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 it can complement policies of, the, of each government in, uh, in, in pursuit of those goals. Uh, secondly, uh, the United States wants to continue to play a strong role in the Asia-Pacific economy. It has been in the forefront of APEC since its founding, and this has a long-term horizon. So I think that, uh, uh, it is, as I said, it's not a containment issue. There's, there's, there's uh, and, and I don't believe most people in China feel that way. I know that there have been commentators, uh, biased commentators, as we have here in Washington, who take both sides uh, for political reasons and, and otherwise. And so uh, that's part of the national debate uh, and, and part of the international negotiating uh, posture. But I'm not, I'm not concerned, and I think uh, the United States and China, it's in both our countries' interest uh, to be working closely together and eventually to uh, achieve what uh, we have both committed to in APEC. Just take the gentleman there, and then the gentleman, distinguished gentleman here in the front row. Uh, uh, Steve Winters. Let me just say one thing. I want to thank Chris Nelson, who's a senior associate with our Mexico Institute, who's volunteered to bring the uh, questions here from the flow overflow room. Thank you, Chris. Please. Steve Winters, local researcher. A uh, quick question for Mr. Schott. Uh, you've sort of been disparaging the quality, as you put it, of the uh, trade agreements uh, that China has with the uh, various uh, neighboring countries. And, of course, one of the buzzwords in favor of TPP is that this is the high quality, the high level agreement. However, the, the fact of the matter seems to be that the amount of trade between China and these regional neighbors is just increasing exponentially. I mean, it's just out of sight, and they all recognize that. So if the purpose of the trade agreements is to lead to increased trade, they're certainly successful. So by what standard do you judge them as low quality when they're working so well? Let's take another question. Mr. Malloy? Yeah, Pat Malloy. I, I Will you wait for the uh, microphone, please? Sure. Yeah, Pat Malloy. I teach trade law at Catholic University Law School, but the, I was general counsel of the Senate Banking Committee in 88 when we wrote the provision of law requiring Treasury to identify countries that manipulate their currency to gain trade advantage. Uh, in the past, the Treasury has identified Korea and China. Uh, Japan has always been in that group that may be doing that. Uh, and you want to bring China, or the thought is maybe China and Korea would both come in to this TPP. Do you think this agreement then should cover exchange rates as an important part of dealing with these kind of trade problems? 
And let me add this, a third question, uh, if I may, for the panel from the overflow room. Uh, what is your comment on the possibility of Taiwan joining TPP, a question that was also posed to the ambassador? Jeff, why don't you, we had a... Why don't, why don't you <laughs> take the, uh, the overflow? Well, this, this is, uh, that's, uh, what is, you both are almost at the table. Uh, what are your <laughs> thoughts, uh, Mexico and Canada, about inviting Taiwan to join at some point the TPP negotiations? Well, um, Taiwan is part of APEC, right? So if TPP is going to be the basis for um, free trade area of the Pacific, then probably there needs to be ways to think how to accommodate Taiwan. No? It, it's hard to comment on that without getting into a discussion of political ra relations exactly. with China and the greater China region. So I'm going to opt out and say Canada, to the extent I can speak on behalf of Canada, <laughs> is, is open to as many members as possible within the TPP. We are, as I said, a small economy and it, we do better when we move in groups. There's been some discussions of Canada doing a bilateral with China. And great, more power to us. And you know, maybe we can get an agreement like New Zealand did, but that's still a very small agreement because we don't have the market power. So we're in it with, uh, with TPP, with whoever wants to play. And we're also looking at the Pacific Alliance as well. What about the currency question? I mean, that's something that really has affected uh, many countries. Uh, if, a, if a country is in fact keeping its currency cautiously under value that reflects uh, on virtually all the competitor countries. Do, does Japan now, which suddenly is worried about an overvalued yen, do they uh, take a view on other countries that may be manipulating their currency? You know, it, it's interesting that um, unlike the, the, the big debate we've had in the United States about China's currency, Japanese don't seem to care very much. Uh, it's, it's just never currency manipulation by China, undervalued uh, Chinese yuan, just doesn't uh, come up in Japan. Now, that may be in part because if you look at the trade data for Japan, and if you, instead of looking just at Japan PRC trade, you throw in Hong Kong because a lot of things that are labeled exports to Hong Kong are just passing through Hong Kong. Um, Japan does not have a trade deficit with China. It's probably one of the only countries in the world that does not have a trade deficit with China. Uh, and so that probably explains why the currency issue just doesn't seem to get any traction there. What about Mexico and Canada? Do you feel the impact from other countries using their currencies as a uh, strategic tool in trade? We feel the impact because your currency is devalued. We don't even <laughs> want to think about China. <laughs> but I got a great price on an iPad. Uh, I'm going to defer that question to real economists. <laughs> um, it's, for Mexico, it's one of the most serious issues with um, China. Not only um, the manipulation of the currency, but also the huge deficit that we have with China. And in addition to that, you have to add uh, trade remedy laws that have to somehow um, consider the currency in terms of how to estimate um, normal value and all that. No? So um, for Mexico, I don't know if uh, on the trade side we have <coughs> defined a specific position in terms of uh, having that issue on TPP, but Mexico is certainly part of the uh, WTO debate in, in, this, in this area okay. with China. Okay. You China want seems to be hovering around this question, Jeff. What are your Yeah. What are your well, thoughts? let me let me. Uh, of course, he, Jeff used to work at the Treasury, and if you've ever been in the U.S. government, you know that only the Treasury can mention. That's right. You don't want trade, trade negotiators mucking up with something <laughs> important. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but actually, and and I'll, I'll return to the, the the first question last. But actually, trade agreements have long covered this issue. Article 15 of the GATT deals with uh, the issue of uh, manipulating, essentially manipulating currencies to uh, undermine uh, the value of trade concessions. Uh, now, the, the process and the procedures of Article 15 don't work. And they don't work for a very simple reason. 
because any uh, uh, case brought again in under the WTO, uh, citing this GATT provision, requires a certification by the International Monetary Fund that a country is manipulated. And that certification has to come from the executive board. And the executive board is, will not make that determination because members of the executive board are scared of China. I'm never going to be a diplomat. And <laughs> but, but that's the way it is. I'm just now, writing down that quote. So. Now, the efforts <laughs> of the Congress and, and the efforts of groups pressuring for currency legislation and, and countervailing measures has essentially been directed at the IMF to do its work, to do its job. Then the Congress wouldn't have had to spend and your commission wouldn't have had to spend all these hours debating on what can be done or passing laws, tinkering with the uh, contingent protection uh, uh, statutes that deal with a small part, a very small part of the problem. Uh, I think much more needs to be done in, 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 in terms of uh, uh, getting uh, better coordination and cooperation on the trade and the financial objectives. This has been a problem that we tried to, to, uh, to deal with back in the late 70s at the end of the Tokyo round uh, with obviously not much success. Uh, but it's something where the IMF needs to, needs to work more closely with, uh, with the WTO. Uh, and if push comes to shove and, and in the administration wants to file a case under Article 15, it has, that's its right to do so. That would certainly sh uh, shine a spotlight uh, on, the, uh, on the issue, though unless the IMF came forward with the certification, we would probably lose that case. Uh, but uh, in the interim, this pressure, whether it's from, from uh, uh, the Congress or from other countries, Brazil, Mexico, and others that uh, have been starting to talk about trade and exchange rates in the WTO, uh, I think uh, uh, there has been an evolution in Chinese policy, uh, and it's at least moving in the right direction. Uh, is it sustainable? That's, that's a good question. And, uh, but but uh, at least uh, uh, the quiet diplomacy and, and, and pressure that Secretary Geithner and others have been putting on the Chinese for, for, for some time seems to have, have, have had some, some, some uh, modicum of success. Um, a word on Taiwan. Uh, uh, I think it will be very difficult for Taiwan to join the TPP in the near future. Uh, I think Taiwan is doing itself a favor by strengthening cross-straits relations uh, because that is probably the avenue for Taiwan to get into the Asia, uh, to, to get in sooner rather than later in an Asia-Pacific deal as part of a bridging operation uh, that involves China, Korea, Japan, uh, and 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 if Taiwan can 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 work with those countries, it could perhaps build part of that bridge. But that's, this, is, this is sort of blue sky thinking a couple of years down the road. But that's what it makes sense because the political constraints for, chi uh, for Taiwan's entry into the ongoing negotiation of the initial deal, I think, are, 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 are just too high. Final point on, on, on shallow integration or low quality. Low quality in terms of the extent of exceptions and omissions. No, no, no question about that. It's low quality. Shallow integration, focusing on just the sort of border measures, not behind the border measures. Uh, and again, numerous loopholes, soft commitments, as, as Ed uh, was, was, was talking about. Uh, why, why has trade grown? Because these are high growth countries. And the trade agreement has been totally irrelevant to the growth in the trade. In fact, if you look at the utilization of those trade preferences, and the Asia Development Bank has done some recent work on that, the utilization rates of those trade preferences is very low. It has been increasing in the last few years, but it is still at a very low level, maybe 20 or 30 percent. And so from that I conclude that the trade agreements a actually are more important for political relations than economic relations between those countries at this stage. Let me just uh, pose a question that came in from the, uh, one of the overflow rooms. 
It seems USTR hopes to wrap, the, wrap up the IP chapter prior to Mexico's entry. <laughs> what is Mexico's stance on the current high standard IP provisions being discussed? <laughs> well, it's hard for me to give you a definite answer <laughs> because I'm not part of the negotiation <laughs> and I'm not part of government. However, what I can tell you is that um, having the ACTA conditionality in terms of, a, um, let's say, how, how we put it in a nice way, like a confidence building measure that Mexico will sign ACTA and will commit to IP, uh, created a lot of concern in Mexico. The problem is that we really don't know exactly what we're talking about. We have no real information about what it really means for Mexico to be part of uh, TPP and what are the IP commitments and how different they are from what we already have in NAFTA or what we have in WTO. We really don't know. And probably um, it's more of a political question than a substantive question. Okay. Well, let's take just a couple more questions, then we'll have to move on to the next panel. We don't want to neglect inside U.S. trade, certainly. Uh, the gentleman here in the front and the gentleman in the uh, lady in the back there. You've made the Institute for Foreign Policy Analysis. Did you want me to go first? Is that That's one. You've got the microphone, and then we, okay. we, uh, maybe we will not neglect inside U.S. trade. We're, we're all faithful leaders of inside U.S. trade. But for the sake of both U.S.-China relations and for the effectiveness of the TPP, should we be maybe not courting China but encouraging China in vehicles like the security and economic dialogue or some other means uh, to urge them along, uh, increase the chances that – they become interested in TPP. Jeff, I think that probably starts with you, and then we all. I, I can give it a very short answer. Yes, and I think we're doing that uh, uh, so that they increase the readiness, their preparation and readiness for 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 participating in the future. Yeah. We, uh, Hi. Thanks again. Uh, this is Jamie from Inside US Trade. Um, just uh, two quick uh, questions, one for uh, Ms. Sanchez on Mexico. Um, do you sense, I know Mexico has been very enthusiastic about joining TPP um, and says it can live up to the high standard, but do you sense a shift in uh, policy in Mexico? I mean, I'm wondering about things like the U.S. is insisting that all TPP countries should have to sign up to the information technology agreement. You know, Mexico has steadfastly refused to sign up to that for years. You know, is there... Do you see a shift or with the incoming administration where Mexico might be willing to accommodate that? And, and similarly, building on your point about government procurement, you know, that's another difficult issue. Again, we, we kind of all know Mexico's position, but I mean, do you sense that they might be willing to really push that and agree to something new uh, in the context of TPP? Uh, and then for Mr. Shaw, just a quick question on um, your uh, counterbalancing views on Japan coming in. Uh, just wanted to clarify one thing. On Korea coming in, I kind of thought Korea would be, you know, interested in joining TPP too, but then we haven't heard much from them. Are you still convinced that they really want to come in in the near term to TPP? And, and kind of, if so, why haven't they been more aggressive on that so far? Okay, Thanks. Mexico first and then East Asia next. Okay. Um, I don't want to be cynical, but I think that there's there's really no – substantive explanation of why Mexico shifted its position from no TPP to full TPP. Uh, basically, the Calderon administration has very little to show in terms of trade legacy. The only free trade agreement that we were able to negotiate was the Peru-Mexico free trade agreement, and that took six years, and it was a very, very difficult uh, process to pass it through, through the Senate. So, um, Second, the Calderon administration will be over on November 30th. There's a new government coming in, the PRI. And I think that the bet right now is let's be part of this deal. We cannot afford to not be part of it because uh, our integration to the NAFTA market, and let's see what happens. I think that um, if Mexico is going to sign up to IPA or not, I mean, basically Mexico has been adamant to it because Mexico doesn't want to give duty free access to, to the sector. Uh, but we'll see. And if at the end of the day Mexico doesn't want to, uh, thinks that it's not uh, to its advantage, well, Mexico will decide what it wants to pass it through the Senate or not. And with democracy, it's been uh, proved 
that um, passing free trade agreements in the Senate can become very difficult. What you say, say something about Korea. Let me say something, uh, something about Korea. Um, my sense is that it, the Koreans went through a tough time with the Chorus Agreement. Uh, it was uh, a difficult negotiation, very uh, controversial at home. They, they got it passed through their, their parliament, but again, difficult. Uh, so my sense is that maybe they're say, well, okay, we did that, Let, let's wait a little bit. And in waiting, um, there seems to be an attitude of, well, we can, we can probably take on one more new negotiation. Should it be TPP or should it be China, Japan, Korea? Uh, kind of weighing those two things. And frankly, from the Korean standpoint, they've got this agreement now with the United States. Uh, the other participants in TPP are relatively small trade partners for Korea relative to the United States. Uh, so from that standpoint, why not go do one with Japan and China, who are the other two giant uh, trading partners for Korea? Jeff, maybe a Slight, slightly different perspective. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Koreans did the same deal with Europe that they did with us, essentially, and it was much less controversial. So that wasn't the issue. Uh, but they had to digest a lot, and they went through a lot of ups and downs before the deal was finally implemented this spring. Uh, now, there was the, the initial delay uh, in considering TPP because the opposition party to the, ru uh, the, the, uh, the ruling party uh, used the uh, chorus FTA as a rallying cry in opposition to the, to the current government, even though the opposition party were the ones that actually started and negotiated the deal. Uh, it's politics, it's <laughs> politics. Uh, and they thought that would be to their advantage in the National Assembly elections in April, and that would then kick, kick start their, their drive to win the presidency uh, at, uh, in the election at the end of the year. Well, that strategy didn't work. The, the voters didn't, re, uh, it didn't resonate with the voters. And, and so the TP, opposition to TPP fell uh, off the, not totally off the table, but became much more muted. As a result of that, when the current Korean trade minister came to Washington in May and gave a talk at the Peterson Institute, uh, he responded to questions uh, about this and, and said that it was probably something that would be favorably considered uh, going forward. Now, Ed, Ed is right. The first priority for Korea is Korea-China. It's not Korea-China-Japan. Uh, that's, that's, that's a different level. That's, uh, uh, but the Korea-China talks got underway in the beginning of May. And uh, they're not going to be easy. They're not going to be as comprehensive as the chorus uh, or, or, or TPP. Uh, but it, it is going to be important both economically and politically uh, for Korea. I think uh, what they see now is uh, moving forward, they're not going to make any big economic decisions before the presidential election uh, in, in, in December and the new Korean president enters office in late February. So I, I suspect that it will be left to the, uh, to the next president to, uh, to decide. Uh, one other factor, and Ed may want to comment on this, I think one of the reasons why the decision will, will be in favor of moving forward in TPP is because not only uh, because, uh, because of its imp implications for Korea-Japan relations. And I think it could unblock a, de a decision by Korea to join TPP could at the same time unblock long suspended bilateral FTA mm -hmm. negotiations between Korea and Japan. And, and so that dynamic uh, is, is something that hasn't been dis uh, mentioned uh, so far today, but I think could be important going forward. Great, let's make this the last question. We'll move to the next panel after. Hi, uh, Nadia Chow with the Liberty Times, uh, Taiwan. Uh, I think Ambassador Marantos just mentioned you don't need an invitation to become a TPP uh, member, but Obviously, you know, Professor Dawson and uh, Sanchez just mentioned uh, Mexico and Canada were invited 
So is there actually an invitation for girls waiting outside to get into the ballroom? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you have to make a decision uh, for the pro and con in such a short time. I, I mean, domestically, how could you, you know, how did you make the process smooth? <laughs> Thank you. Because Laura well is our two-step specialist. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll talk about the accession process or the membership process. No, it isn't an official invitation. And if you read the TPP text, it's very vague. But it's, it's a, it seems to me to be a consensus process with a right of objection. So if anyone objects, then that uh, effectively blocks the membership of the uh, aspiring, uh, aspiring party. So Canada embarked, and, and Mexico, we, we embarked on, on a charm offensive. And with some of the TPP members, we had to be more charming than others. Um, and there were some condi soft conditions that were, that were put out, uh, at least between the, the US and Canada, um, of things that they would like to see Canada do before we were considered to be uh, ambitious enough, fast moving enough, et cetera, et cetera. And so we, we worked on these conditions. But it wasn't just the US. In fact, New Zealand was quite uh, an opponent to Canada's uh, membership because of our policies on supply managed dairy. With Luce and Laura, how could a charm offensive fail? <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I may add, in 2010, for example, when Malaysia requested uh, accession to TPP, uh, Malaysia got invi the invitation and accession to the table without any problem. Uh, in the case of Mexico, for example, not only the U.S. has this consultation process, but also Peru was putting a lot of mm, questions and concerns because Peru was not happy with the kind of agreement that we ended up with. So that's not part of the, of the debate, but yeah, you, I mean, there are ways in which the process can be stopped. Let me make the last question from the overflow room. There's a question about what's happening in Europe and the turmoil in Europe. What if, in part, the Eurozone collapsed? What would that mean for the TPP? <laughs> would that so overwhelm the economic situation? Like I'm trying to find some question that makes Jeff a little less optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my optimism depends, it's a temporal process, so it's a question of the time frame. If you're talking about events in the next three or four months or six months, then, then there, there's reason for some skepticism. If you take the government's timetable for the negotiations, well, yeah, I'm, I'm not optimistic. Um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, impact of, of problems in the Eurozone, everyone's got their doomsday scenario, so I won't assume you know, the world is coming to an end and, a, and an asteroid is going to hit us and what does that mean for the TPP. Rather, uh, what happens if the Eurozone continues to uh, uh, kick the can down the road, they don't uh, do uh, the, the adjustments needed to restore growth and uh, they perhaps slide into a slightly deeper recession, maybe lose, lose Greece uh, in, the, in, in the process. Well, that will have an impact on global growth. And in a period of slow growth, that's going to make it difficult to manage the political economy decisions in many countries that are needed in, in determining whether uh, countries will support changes in current policies uh, uh, that will open up new trade and investment opportunities but require adjustment of their own firm. And so the weaker the growth, the more political resistance there is to changing existing policies the more demand for new protection, or at least temporary protection, and therefore that'll be an in, in impediment to, uh, to uh, concluding the talks. I think that just emphasizes the point that right now 75% of our trade is with shrinking moribund economies, so we need to negotiate harder, faster with the emerging, emerging markets. Mm -hmm. Could I add one other angle to this? Uh, over the past 15 years, there's been a lot of talk in Asia, principally in Japan, but a little bit elsewhere, about the possibility of a common currency in East Asia. And I'm guessing and kind of hoping <laughs> that this is the end of it. <laughs> because now they can see, even in Europe, with you know, countries that were close together geographically, common land borders, uh, a much more common history than is the case in East Asia, how difficult it is to make this thing work and how much harder it would be in East Asia. Well, thank you all. Wonderful panel. Please join me in a round of applause. <laughs>